Uh, welcome to this week's edition of the Humanities Forum. The Humanities Forum is an initiative of the Humanities Program at Providence College, directed by Professor Jim Keating and moderated by Professor Raymond Hain. My name is Pat McFarlane. I teach in the Philosophy Department and the Development of Western Civilization Program here at Providence College. Because Professor Hain is on sabbatical this semester, he asked me to help moderate the Humanities Forum uh, uh, in his absence, although he is present with us today. <clears throat> the forum is pleased to welcome to campus today a very distinguished guest, Professor Daniel J. Mahoney. Professor Mahoney has taught political science since 1986 at Assumption College, right up the Route 146 in Worcester, Massachusetts, where he holds the Augustan Chair in Distinguished Scholarship. Professor Mahoney has written extensively on Marxism and totalitarian ideology in the 20th century, on statesmanship and the history of political, and the history of political philosophy in scores of books and articles. Some of his books include Alexander Solzhenitsyn, The Ascent from Ideology, The Conservative Foundations of the Liberal Order, Defending Democracy Against Its Modern Enemies and Immoderate Friends, and De Gaulle, Statesmanship, Grandeur, and Modern Democracy. Among his recent volumes that pertain especially to Professor Mahoney's lecture today are his anthology of the writings of Solzhenitsyn, The Solzhenitsyn Reader, New and Essential Writings, 1947 to 2005, edited with Edward E. Erickson, Jr., and published by ISI, and most recently, the Idol of Our Age, How the Religion of Humanity Subverts Christianity, published by Encounter Books just this past December, 2018, a work praised by Roger Scruton, Marianne Glendon, and Remy Brog. Uh, when Dr. Hain and I were, were talking about treating Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn this semester as the main cornerstone of the Humanities Forum, the first person we thought of to come and speak to us about Solzhenitsyn was Professor Mahoney. Um, so please help me in welcoming him to Providence College. Professor Mahoney. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I didn't have to come very far or catch a plane. All of that to the good, and I think this is the first time I've done anything in an official capacity here at Providence College. I'm very happy to be here. I was telling some of the faculty associated with the Humanities Forum that I was very busy last semester because it, uh, Solzhenitsyn was born December 11, 1918, and this, is the, this was the centennial in the fall. So there were events all over the world, and I was asked to participate in many forums and write many articles and tributes, and, and uh, so uh, this is, the only one I was invited to do in the spring. So I, I, I really welcomed it. And uh, as I said, I'm happy to be here. Uh, as I said just a second ago, December 11th, 2018, marked the 100th anniversary of the birth of uh, Alexander Isayevich Solzhenitsyn. Um, Solzhenitsyn was a writer, and I think this is sometimes un under estimated, a, a writer of immense talent and spiritual depth. He was the century's greatest critic of the totalitarian immolation of liberty and human dignity, a thinker and moral witness who illumined the fate of the human soul, hemmed in by barbed wire in the East, and by a materialist cornucopia in the West. Ah. The mature Solzhenitsyn remained remarkably faithful to the twin imperatives of courage and truth. A French biographer of Solzhenitsyn um, uh, entitled his book, I'll say it in English, Seven Lives in a Century. There really were seven lives in a century. It's a remarkable, remarkable life and a remarkable um, moral witness. 
my friend Alan Besson's song compares uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn to St. George, who slew, this, in this case, slew the dragon of ideological despotism with rare eloquence, determination, and grit. Now, Solzhenitsyn had two great self-described missions, as he called them. The first was to witness to those who suffered and perished in the Soviet prison camp system and accompanying manifestations of communist repression. For example, the millions of peasants who died during collectivization and uh, dekulakization, or the millions of Christians who died from religious persecution. Solzhenitsyn wanted to trace, uh, he also wanted to trace the, uh, the roots of the Soviet tragedy in the great unfolding red wheel, as he called it, especially in the February revolution of 1917 that preceded the October revolution, the communist or Bolshevik revolution later that year and made it all but inevitable. Solzhenitsyn is the author of two great, I love this expression, it comes from the uh, Franco-Swiss Solzhenitsyn scholar, Georges Niva. He says, Solzhenitsyn is the author of two great literary cathedrals, the Gulag Archipelago, which only comes in at about 1,600 pages. There are two authorized abridgments, one prepared by Solzhenitsyn and my colleague Edward Erickson, about 500 pages in English and a Russian abridgment prepared by Natalia Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn's widow, that uh, was released in Russian in 2010 and is now required uh, reading in Russian high schools. Um, these are two, and this is the subtitle of the Gulag Archipelago, Experiments in Literary Investigation. That's why Barnes and Noble often puts the Gulag Archipelago in the fiction section. They don't seem to realize that a non-fiction work can be a work of literature, of great literature. Uh, both of these books will require decades to come to terms with in any adequate way. The Red Wheel consists of four knots, investigations of discrete periods of time, August 1914, November 1916, March 17 in four volumes, and April 17 in two volumes, with an appendix going up to 1922, uh, 6,000 pages, 10 volumes. Uh, March 17 is in the process of appearing in English from University of Notre Dame Press. It's a wonderful, wonderful work but I think someday, too, it will need an authorized abridgment. Many silly and even pernicious things have been written about Solzhenitsyn by those who confuse love of truth with dogmatism. When he gave the Harvard Address in 78, both the New York Times and uh, Washington Post editor editorialized, almost on cue, that he believed in something called truth with a capital T. Um, and the active struggle with evil, as Solzhenitsyn once described it. This, this is confused with moral fanaticism. And among these tendentious critics are those who mock patriotism, repentance, self-limitation, and liberty under God. That is all of Solzhenitsyn's enduring themes and commitments. Solzhenitsyn's was a long but ultimately rewarding journey. Since early boyhood, he wished to become a writer. He edited a magazine when he was 10 called The 20th Century. And he was the editor, the publisher, the cartoonist, the copy editor, uh, the writer. He was interviewed about it once by a biographer, and he said, well, it's juvenilia. But it says something, this ambition. De Gaulle was once asked by a high school teacher at the age of 15, what are you going to do when you grow up? And he said, 
I'm going to be General de Gaulle, and I'm going to save France and Europe from an invasion by the Germans. Some people are precocious and have a sense of destiny. One of the key chapters of August 1914, the first volume of The Red Wheel, depicting the Battle of Tannenberg, big Russian loss to the, uh, to the, to the Germans early in the war, and the suicide of General Samsonov, very moving, very evocative chapter, was already written in the fall of 1936 before Solzhenitsyn was 18. So this book was published in 1970-71 in Russia, not in the Soviet Union, in the West. And a major, the first, I think, significant chapter in the book on Tannenberg and the suicide of General Samsonov was unchanged from when Solzhenitsyn had written it when he was 18. So that says something about him as a writer. But he dreaded what kind of writer he might have become without the experience of the gulag, of the Soviet camps. It was in the prison camp in 1940, uh, 1945 and 1946, he wrote. And he was arrested. He was a captain in the, in the Red Army in East Prussia. He was arrested because he and a high school friend had written some letters where there are some coded criticisms of Stalin. Um, so it was in the prison camps in 45 and 46, as he describes it in various interviews and in the chapter, The Ascent. Uh, remember that. That's probably the most important chapter in the Gulag Archipelago, in the central section of the Gulag Archipelago, the Solon Barbed Wire. But he wrote of how the scales of ideology literally fell from his eyes in the camps, that he was, quote, completely cleansed of any Marxist belief. Solzhenitsyn tells us in an interview that when he was, he had been brought up by his Aunt Irina and his mother. His father had died in a hunting accident uh, six months before he was born in 1918. But Solzhenitsyn talks about how he was brought up, brought up in an Orthodox family, he was very faithful, but he was converted through propaganda in high school to communism and he remembers in shame tearing off a crucifix that his Aunt Irina had given him, tearing it off of his neck. He also tells us in an autobiographical poem, Dorshenka, The Way or The Trail, that on his honeymoon in 1940, he got up early to read Das Kapital. So he was a convinced Marxist-Leninist when he went to prison. And he came out totally liberated from communist dogmatism. And he credits his cellmates. His cellmates helped him see the light of truth on the, and the unparalleled mendacity of the ideological lie, the lie at the heart of communism, the destructive illusion that evil is not inherent in the human soul, that human beings and societies can be transformed at a revolutionary stroke, and that free will is always subordinate to historical necessity. The Marxists, of course, upheld an extreme version of historical necessity or historical determinism. History was written in advance. Communism would inevitably triumph. Resistance to uh, a universal communist state was hopeless and helpless because of the laws of history that Marx and Engels and Lenin had articulated in their theoretical works. Solzhenitsyn's life is marked by this great paradox. In the camps, hungry and cold, and subject to limitless repression by camp guards and camp authorities, he recovered an appreciation of the purpose of things. Or we might say he discovered the truth about the soul. The central section of the seven sections of the Gulag Archipelago is entitled The Soul and Barbed Wire. And it begins with a quotation from St. Paul from Corinthians, let me show you a mystery. 
about how uh, we won't die, but we'll be changed, right? Solzhenitsyn is not talking about the transformation of the physical body into the spiritual body that St. Paul talks about, but he's talking about a transformation of the soul that he and others experienced uh, while in the Soviet camps. And I'll quote this line a little later, but uh, I'll bring it up now. At the end of the chapter called The Ascent, which describes this paradoxical ascent of the soul in the camps, Solzhenitsyn says, and it's a little jarring, he says, bless you prison for having been in my life. And I think he blesses prison in large part because he came to much greater self-knowledge. He discovered the truth about the soul and the scales of ideology and the ideological lie fell from his eyes. Without the experience of the camps, he feared he would have become a hack, propagandistic Soviet writer. But he adds in many interviews, a writer I would have become. By the age of 27, Solzhenitsyn had an outlook that he retained until his death on August 3rd, 2008 a worldview deepened only by his reaffirmation of faith in the living God near the end of his imprisonment at Egapastus in the Kazakh steppes in the early 1950s. Uh, there's a beautiful poem at the end of the chapter on the ascent where uh, Solzhenitsyn reiterates his faith in the living God and uh, it's very striking, I think, that he puts that poem, uh, which is only published in a collection of his camp poems in 1999 in Russian, but uh, he put it in the Gulag Archipelago because part of this spiritual ascent he underwent in the camp included a return to an affirmation of faith in the living God. Um, in the introduction called Inception, to his autobiographical poem, The Road, or it can be translated, The Trail, 7,000 lines memorized in the camps and composed without benefit of pen and paper. There's a long story there. He got, a, he got some rosary beads made of stale bread by some Lithuanians who were very impressed by his piety. It had 100 beads, and he used it as a mnemonic device to memorize all his writings. Quite a story that he tells in the Gulag Archipelago. In the inception, Solzhenitsyn had already spoken of his burning desire to convey the experience of the camps to an uncomprehending world. I quote from a translation being prepared by the author's son, Ignat. Oh, who? Oh, when will learn all about this and staunchly write it down with lucid understanding, not with ire. The time to write is now, precisely now. This is Solzhenitsyn in the late 40s and early 50s. He's ready to tell the truth about the camps to an uncomprehending world. All right. In addition to recovering the memory of a wounded Russia, Solzhenitsyn often said, I, I want to be the memory of my people. I want to recover a lost memory. In addition to recovering the memory of a wounded Russia and taking aim at an inhuman ideology that had assaulted Russia's best traditions and the flower of the nation, Solzhenitsyn recovered a classical and Christian appreciation of the human soul as the most precious part of God's creation. Any serious reader of the Gulag Archipelago, one who approaches that work with a minimally open heart and mind, cannot help but be moved, even transformed, by a close reading of the soul and barbed wire, the fourth and central of its seven sections. For much of my paper, I'm gonna concentrate on that section, which I think is the most important, 
uh, the most serious and deep and the one that gets to Solzhenitsyn's most important concerns about politics, the struggle against evil, and the ascent of the human soul. If, as Natalia Solzhenitsyn has suggested, this experiment in literary investigation is ultimately an epic poem about the drama of good and evil in the human soul, and not merely an assault on a particularly monstrous and inhuman regime, which it surely also is, then the soul and barbed wire is the key to unraveling the reflection on the soul at the heart of Solzhenitsyn's moral and philosophical self-understanding. George Cannon, in a review of the Gulag Archipelago, volume one in the New York Review of Books, said, quite rightly, I think, that the Gulag Archipelago was the most powerful indictment of a political regime ever written. And yet, in the Blue Caps, maybe the second most important chapter in the book, in volume one, Solzhenitsyn says, if you think this book is just a political ex expose, slam its cover shut right now. So both things are true. It's a powerful political indictment of totalitarianism, but it's ultimately a book about the human soul, the drama of good and evil in the human soul. So if you think this is just you know, an anti-communist tract or tract for the times or useful instrument for undermining the Soviet Union, slam its cover shut right now. This powerful work, at one and the same time, an historical inquest, personal memoir, political meditation, and philosophical reflection, it's all those things, is more than the sum of its parts, as Natalia Solzhenitsyn observes in her wise and memorable introduction, The Gift of Incarnation, to the 2010 Russian abridgment of that work. By the way, you can find that text in the New Criterion sometime in 2012 as an, append and as an appendix to my 2014 book, uh, The Other Solzhenitsyn, Telling the Truth About a Misunderstood Writer and Thinker. Um, as every reader of the Gulag Archipelago knows, Solzhenitsyn's central theme is, I quote, the line dividing good from evil that cuts through the heart of every human being. It was only in a Bolshevik prison, communist prison, in the late 1940s that Solzhenitsyn gradually discovered, it's a beautiful and memorable line from the ascent, that the line between good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart, every human heart, and through all human hearts. Ideologies such as Jacobinism and communism, and by the way, there's a wonderful new edition of the abridgment out in England with an introduction by Jordan P. B. Peterson. It's very controversial for some reason on college campuses, but it's a marvelous introduction. And uh, he builds on Solzhenitsyn's theme that all of us are victims and victimizers at the same time. So this contemporary cult of the victim is an invitation to totalitarianism because it encourages and it institutionalizes a murderous or potentially murderous ideological manichaeanism. So whether it's aristocrats who are the root of all evil, merchants, Christians, kulags, white males, um, one is misunderstanding the drama of good and evil in the human soul. It is the human heart itself that is the source of this great drama. Um, and so, ideologists and totalitarians inevitably war on human nature and aim to eradicate evil rather than, and I quote Solzhenitsyn, to constrict it within each person. The same human being, as I said a moment ago, can be at once victim and victimizer. In contrast, the latter goal, restricting evil in each human heart, um, is the aim of all non-utopian philosophical and religious thought. It is also an indispensable precondition of free 
and decent politics. Solzhenitsyn was the scourge of what he elsewhere calls bloody physical revolutions, since they show no knowledge of the human soul and inevitably lead, quote, not to a bright future, but to worse perdition, to worse violence. See Solzhenitsyn's text, An Orbital Journey, uh, a text from 1974, a kind of precursor to the Harvard Address that uh, was translated by Stefan Solzhenitsyn recently, introduced by me, and it was published at National Review on January 7, 2019. Solzhenitsyn was not only the anti-ideologist par excellence, but he was also a kind of informal Socratic philosopher who strove for self-knowledge. His experience in Soviet prisons and camps, as well as in internal exile in Kazakhstan between 1945 and 1956, allowed him to pursue the great Socratic and Delphic imperatives to know thyself. That pursuit of self-knowledge conveyed in the written word at first surreptitiously, Solzhenitsyn began as a self-described underground writer, has, of course, profound political implications. But if Solzhenitsyn ultimately wanted Burnham Wood to move, you know the phrase from the end of Macbeth? The end of his autobiographical, The Oak and the Calf, Solzhenitsyn says, with the publication of the Gulag Archipelago, Burnham Wood was moving. This was the end of the Soviet order. Um, but his highest goal, I think, was, was surely personal and philosophical self-understanding. As George Niva likes to say, Solzhenitsyn was both a writer and a fighter in French, lutteur, uh, combatant. Um, but I would add, and Niva would surely agree, he was also a thinker even a moral philosopher of sorts. We honor Solzhenitsyn when we do, and I think this is the way to approach a reading of the Gulag Ar Ar Archipelago. We honor him when we do justice to the complexity of his bearing as writer, combatant, thinker, and moral witness. In this moral and intellectual complex complexity, united by the firmest commitment to truth and conscience, lies his ultimate greatness. As the soul and barbed wire demonstrates above all, again, the central section of the Gulag Archipelago, section four of seven, the Gulag Archipelago is, quote, about the ascent of the human spirit, about its struggle with evil, to quote Natalia Solzhenitsyn yet again. The two spiritual possibilities the ascent of the human soul and the struggle with evil are inseparable for Solzhenitsyn. He is not a stoic sage who upholds self-contained apathy. You know, you, you just ignore everything happening around you and find inner serenity. I think Solzhenitsyn thought um, there can't be spiritual serenity independent of all external circumstances. That is surely inhuman and unchristian. As we shall see, the great Russian writer believes that radical evil must be confronted with force if necessary in order to defend the liberty and dignity of the human person. In The Red Wheel and elsewhere, he contests Tolstoy's pacifism, which conflates love with sentimentality and abandons the weak and the innocent to the degradation of inhuman tyranny. Solzhenitsyn never opposed military service and honored those who served their country, but not those who served communist ideology. So you can read a chapter like The Ascent, and you can see, you can be very moved by Solzhenitsyn's powerful description of spiritual ascent of the growth of the soul, under, even under inhuman conditions of imprisonment. And yet that's not good enough for Solzhenitsyn. Such a regime has to be arrest, uh, uh, resisted. 
for the sake of human self-respect and liberty and human dignity. The whole third volume of the Gulag Archipelago. That's what's great about the abridgment. You'll get to it. If you were reading the whole 1,600 words, you wouldn't get to the last 400 pages, which Solzhenitsyn says are all about hope and catharsis. It ends on a high note as a kind of vindication of the human spirit. Solzhenitsyn honors all those who resisted communist totalitarianism, from the heroes who dramatically liberated the camp at Kangir for some 40 days in the spring of 1954, to the remarkable committed escaper, Georgi Pavlovich Tenno, a friend of Solzhenitsyn's who I think escaped from Gulag camps 10 or 11 times, would sometimes get away for 1,000 or 1,200 miles He'd get captured, and he'd do it again. And Solzhenitsyn admired this intrepid spirit. Um, uh, maybe maybe this is, these are Sisyphean efforts, but Tano loved freedom, and he could not, his soul could not be crushed. Solzhenitsyn also talks about the town people of the Russian city of Novocherkask, quote, a town of fateful significance in Russia's history that rose up against communist tyranny in June 1962 at terrible cost without the world learning a thing about their courage and sacrifices until the publication of the third volume of the Gulag Archipelago in 1976. All those Western German, uh, journalists, Agence France Press, the BBC, the Washington Post, New York Times, they're drinking in Moscow bars. There's a city on fire a couple hundred kilometers from Moscow, and not one of them heard about it. Quite, quite <coughs> remarkable. Solzhenitsyn's point, I think, in volume three is the Russian people did not take all of this uh, sitting down, that there was spirited resistance to inhuman totalitarianism. In fact, for Solzhenitsyn, um, the active struggle against evil, as he called it in a 2006 interview, is one vitally important means by which the soul rises above the constraints of external circumstances and the inhuman appeal to survive at any price. And I'm going to come back to this theme. Solzhenitsyn thought the imperative to survive at any price was an invitation to spiritual death and moral nihilism and political surrender and complacency. Now, there's a great dispute in the Gulag uh, literature. There's another great chronicler of the Gulag, Varlam Shalomov. Shalomov was imprisoned in Kalima in the Russian Northeast. It was much colder, the sentences were longer, and many more people died. And he's the author of um, a very important book, uh, um, a bleak and dark book called Kolima Tales. Um, Shalomov, uh, the author of Kolima Tales, vehemently argued that, quote, in the camp situation, human beings never, with the emphasis italicized, never remain human beings. The camps were created to this end. But in his chapter in the Solon Bob Dwyer, or corruption, which comes right after the ascent, Solzhenitsyn adamantly rejects the view that moral corruption was inevitable, even in the camps. No camp, he insisted, can automatically corrupt those human beings with a, quote, stable nucleus with what he sometimes called a principled point of view. The human soul is never simply reducible to external circumstances, even of the worst kind. The permanent relevance of this rejection of the contemporary burial of human free will cannot be overstated. Talking about the relevance for liberal arts, Solzhenitsyn's work remains a welcome and necessary antidote to the scientism and determinism that remains all too regnant in academic 
and intellectual circles, in the social sciences and humanities, for example. Solzhenitsyn adamantly rejects the view that human beings are obliged to choose survival at any price. In chapter 60 of In the First Circle, one of, uh, one of the work's protagonists, Inokenti Volodin, had painfully arrived at the conclusion, that's, that's one of Solzhenitsyn's other great books, a novel uh, in the first circle, that's autobiographical work. He had, uh, Volodin had painfully arrived at the conclusion that self-preservation, not to mention vulgar hedonism, can never be the highest good for human beings with souls. Volodin, this is a great passage, Volodin saw beyond the great truth, and it is a truth, we are only given one life in this world. But Solzhenitsyn says, he became of another law that we are given only one conscience to. This would, would also remain Solzhenitsyn's deepest conviction. As the Russian Nobel laureate points out in the ascent, the deepest and most beautiful chapter in the whole of the Gulag Archipelago, to survive at any price always means at the price of someone else. That is never acceptable. Quote, I quote from the ascent, at that great fork in the camp road, at that great divider of souls, unquote, not a few, if nothing like a majority, chose the path of decency and conscience. They were, de this is a wonderful phrase Solzhenitsyn says, they were determined to preserve their human countenance. You know, a person can have a human face or he can have a different kind of count countenance. A countenance where we've lost our conscience, rejected the requirements of the soul, and seized in some fundamental sense to be a human being. In the ascent, Solzhenitsyn highlights the fundamental decency of his Estonian friend, Arnold Susi. Did a little research on Susi. He was the Minister of Education in Estonia. Uh, a lovely little country that was occupied by the Nazis and the communists, enslaved. And uh, he was sent uh, to, to Lubyanka and then to the Gulag. More about him in a moment. In the ascent, Solzhenitsyn highlights the fundamental decency of his friend, um, Arnold Susi, who later gave him a hiding place in the forests of Estonia to write most of the Gulag Archipelago in the winters of 1965 and 1966. Solzhenitsyn wrote the first, uh, his first chapter that he wrote was the 40 Days of King Geary. He wrote it in 58. He finished editing the book in 68, but 90% of it was written, later edited, but in, I think, a 135-day period and a 125-day period in a log cabin in wintry Estonia. He was hiding in the woods and he wrote KGB had no idea where he was, and this was all due to the beneficence of his old camp mate, Arnold Susi. Susi, Solzhenitsyn tells us, was never a believer. But, but this fundamentally decent man was not about at the age of 50 to go down the path of moral perdition. He refused to become a trustee. This is a major theme in Solzhenitsyn's work. Will you engage in general work like everyone else, or will you collaborate and get a cushy job like in the library or the doctor's office or something where you have a much enhanced chance of surviving, but again, at the price of somebody else? But Susie refused to become a trustee, a person who had a privileged place in the camp because he avoided general work. Susie thus faced a gravely enhanced chance to die at forced labor, aided and abetted by inhuman cold. Solzhenitsyn knew Susie before and after the camps. They spent time together in the Lubanka prison in Moscow in 1945, and he could attest that his Estonian friend, 
remained the same decent man he had been when he entered the camps. Susie, by himself, refutes every claim of sociological determinism. Now, in 200 Years Together, which has not come out in English, it's Solzhenitsyn's massive two-volume work on Russian-Jewish relations. Uh, Solzhenitsyn has been criticized for saying that certain groups in the camps, like the Armenians and the Russian Jews, looked out for their own and tried to get them cushy trustee positions. But Solzhenitsyn says, uh, he speaks about three Jewish friends of his. Um, uh, Boris Gamerov, Vladimir Efroysen, and Yakov Grudensky, who freely accepted general work and did so, he said, quote, from the noblest of Jewish appeals. These were Solzhenitsyn's friends, and he profoundly admired them. They could have readily opted out of the common faith, common fate, uh, by getting these cushy jobs and thus saving themselves the danger of hunger, starvation, cold, death. But he instead they instead chose the path of nobility and self-limitation. Self-limitation is probably the moral quality that Solzhenitsyn most admires in all of his writings. These Jewish prisoners were, according to Solzhenitsyn, in chapter 20 of 200 Years Together, the noblest embodiments of the path of self-limitation that Solzhenitsyn saw as an option even in the hellish world of Soviet forced labor camps. Solzhenitsyn writes about them with respect, friendship, and admiration. He states that he, quote, never loses sight of such examples, the only ones capable of saving humanity. And he adds, all my hope rests in them. So notice, I think while many readers of the Gulag Archipelago instinctively identify spiritual ascent with a Christian commitment, and Solzhenitsyn's spiritual ascent was accompanied by a turn to the Christian faith, there are examples, Susi, Efferson, Grudensky, um, who uh, um, non-believers and Jews who Solzhenitsyn thought embodied this refusal to survive at any price, and it's noblest and most admirable. And Solzhenitsyn gives these men his highest unqualified praise. Solzhenitsyn famously argues that the rejection of survival at any price and the accompanying refusal to eschew general work can and did lead some to a remarkable ascent of the soul, a ripening of the human spirit brought about by redemptive suffering. Once that decision had been made, that I'm not going to stay alive at any price, uh, he says, one could learn patience, love of those near to us, genuine friendship, and much more. One's conscience could awake to the call of duty and the light of God's grace could shine on a ripening soul. And I've already spoken briefly about how this spiritual ascent on Solzhenitsyn's part was accompanied by an emphatic uh, return to the Christian faith that he highlights at the end of the chapter on the ascent. I've, all, 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 I've already quoted the famous and memorable line, bless you prison for having been in my life. Just briefly in the next few minutes, I want to explain why this isn't the end of the story. Uh, Solzhenitsyn never recommends moral or religious quietism. There's a chapter in the soul and barbed wire called Our Muzzled Freedom. And Solzhenitsyn talks about how the lie and betrayal and class cruelty had become forms of existence in the Soviet Union under Lenin and Stalin. Under such soul-destroying circumstances, anti-political or apolitical stoic apathy is impossible, immoral, and irresponsible. 
Such evil must be resisted out of self-respect and respect for the common good and love of one's people. I have a little section here I'm not going to go in. And for those of you, I think, in the faculty group and student group who are reading the abridgment, this is missing. But Solzhenitsyn has a little, he ends the uh, Soul and Barbed Wire with a section called Some Individual Stories. And he tells the story of a woman named Anna Skripnikova. And Anna Skripnikova was arrested something like 50 times between 1917 and 1959, in and out of prison, in and out of camps. She'd get released. And she spoke her mind like a free woman. She called the, the Bolsheviks barbarians. They were destroying religion, destroying culture, arresting innocent people. And then in the 50s, even three times during Stalin's time, she sent open letters to the UN attacking savage barbary, uh, barbarism in the Soviet Union. Uh, I have a much longer treatment in my written text. But here's a, here's a wonderful line. Um, Two lines. Solzhenitsyn says about Skripnikova, she had a moral code, and I quote it, it is better to die than to permit one's spiritual core to be broken. You young people, think about that. And, uh, and here's, a, here's a, the last line, which I think has profound political implications. And if everyone were even one quarter as implacable as Anna Skripnikova, the history of Russia would have been far different. So here's an individual who was not a prisoner of, of material and social circumstances. I have a little section where I talk about, Solzhenitsyn says in an interview um, near the end of his life, he was asked, who do you most admire? Simple people of moral probity, like one, uh, like Ivan Denisovich, and one day, uh, uh, one day, and uh, Ivan, uh, one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, or Matryona in his great novella, the one, uh, the one virtuous person without whom the city cannot stand, this holy Russian peasant, so un-Soviet, and Solzhenitsyn says in response to the questions, "Of course, I admire them." Um, Ivan Denisovich did not belong did not deserve 10 horrible years in the camps because Stalin was unprepared for the war. <clears throat> Matryona is a, a symbol of moral virtue and Christian piety. But Solzhenitsyn says, but even above these men and women, I admire those who take up an active struggle against evil. Um, and um, there's a very interesting section um, a chapter, a chapter four of volume three of the Gulag Archipelago. Why did we stand for it? Kind of relates to a lot of the things I've been talking about this afternoon. Solzhenitsyn has a discussion of Tolstoy's claim near the end of his life that political liberty doesn't matter at all. The only thing that matters is the moral self-development of the individual. And Solzhenitsyn says he could say that. His Naya Polanya, his great estate, was an open house. He was a famous writer around the world. He had an immense following. Yes, he was excommunicated from the Russian Orthodox Church. But he was visited by people all around the world. He had unlimited freedom to write. But he says, if Tolstoy had experienced what we had all experienced, Akhmatova blockaded in her apartment in, Peter, in Leningrad while her husband and son were in the gulag, um, he too would have recognized political liberty as necessary. So the moral self-development of the individual, stoic apathy is not enough. One needs to actively resist evil. And that involves not so much a guarantee of success, oh, that doesn't hurt, but a refusal to kowtow to a human, des a human despotism. And political liberty also allows human beings to breathe freely, to exercise the moral virtues, to exercise the arts of human intelligence. So as I go on to argue, for Solzhenitsyn, politics is not the highest thing but it's an important thing. 
in his memoir, Between Two Millstones, which covers the years 74 to 94, his 20 years of forced exile in the West, two years in Zurich, 18 years in Cavendish, Vermont, Solzhenitsyn has a wonderful chapter. It appeared in the September uh, 2018 issue of the New Criterion. It's, a, it's called The Sketch of Democracy. And he speaks about his limitless admiration for Swiss democracy. He went to Appenzoll, a Catholic canton, and he saw the Swiss governing themselves according to very old traditions. And he comments that these traditions of morally vigorous and civically vigorous self-government did not deprive from the ideas of the light enlightenment, but come from the ancient forms of political life. The Helvetic Confederacy dates from 1291. Solzhenitsyn's point is, we had some of that in Russia, the Vesh in the Middle Ages, the Zemsfos in the late Tsarist period. Let's try to rekindle whatever we have, whatever is organic in our own tradition that can restore some of the arts, some of the institutions, some of the practices of self-government. Um, all right, I'm uh, just going to end here. As we rapidly move along in the 20th, uh, 21st century, um, it is the 21st century, 2019, Solzhenitsyn, chronicler of the fate of the soul under both ideological despotism, communist totalitarianism, and I think this might sound polemical, but I think it's an empirically accurate statement, an in increasingly soft and relativistic democracy, very much, Solzhenitsyn very much remains our contemporary, a true friend of liberty and human dignity, as Tocqueville would put it, and a partisan of the human soul imparted to us by a just and merciful God. By the way, I hate to say this, but in the academy, there are not a whole lot of partisans of the human soul. The neuroscientists tell us we don't have souls, that our consciousness is reducible to biochemistry and synapses in the brain. The various social sciences tell us we're prisoners of external circumstances. We have a new politics of victimology, a new form of ideological Manichaeanism. The only thing we've forgotten is the human soul. So what contribution can Solzhenitsyn make to uh, the recovery of the liberal arts and the spirit of the liberal arts. Among other things, he can teach us um, what the tyrannical negation of politics and the human soul means. He can teach us the connection between political liberty, self-government, and the act of struggle against evil. He can tell us something about the prospects for the ascent of the soul even in ideological despotisms and our soft and relativistic democracies. In addition, I, I couldn't give you a, a full account of Solzhenitsyn's biography, but I think his courage remains an inspiration for all. While fearlessly slaying the dragon of ideology and ideological despotism, he taught us, and this is the adventure of the Gulag Archipelago, deep and enduring truths about the drama of good and evil in the human soul. He thus remains our permanent contemporary. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mahoney, for that tremendous paper. Um, could we take a couple of minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so for Absolutely. questions? Absolutely. By Great. the way, that last line is, there are a lot of people who say, oh, Solzhenitsyn was important historically, but that's all in the past. That's all in the past. It's not all in the past. The soul isn't in the past. Political liberty is in the past. The act of struggle against evil isn't in the past. These are coeval with the human condition. Uh, one of our traditions here at the forum is to give the first, first question to a student. Um, before the 
we give it, hand it off to a faculty member or someone else. Are there any shy? Are there any students who would like to ask a question or make a comment about Professor Mahoney's talk on Solzhenitsyn? Okay. Hey, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm you. just curious. Um, so you say Solzhenitsyn was a devoted Marxist uh, before he was thrown into the, the gulag, um, but he was he was sent into the camp because of uh, he was sending letters criticizing Stalin. So what was and uh, without naming Stalin? What's that? Without naming Stalin. Oh, right, right. His, they were disguised. His high school buddy and he would make references. They they were not too veiled. The mustached one and. <laughs> you know, okay. things like that. Right. And, uh, but uh, they uh, underestimated Smirsch, how, how all the letters were read. And uh, okay. I think so, it was a little naive on their part to think that the, these letters wouldn't be discovered. Yeah. Sure. So uh, what was Stalin doing wrong, according to the committed Marxist uh, Solzhenitsyn? And well, that's interesting. I didn't exactly bring it out, but uh, you may have uh, uh, you, you may have thought that. Yeah, uh, Solzhenitsyn had arrived at the position, a lot of Western intellectuals had this position, it's one Solzhenitsyn would later emphatically reject, that Stalin had somehow betrayed Marx and Lenin. Now, in the Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn establishes beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was Lenin who created the Gulag Archipelago. It was Lenin who built the first camps. It was Lenin who committed genocide against the Don Cossacks. Half of the Don Cossacks were murdered in 1919, 1920. Bishops were murdered. Priests were imprisoned. Uh, there was a uh, government-induced famine that took the lives of five million people in the Volga River Valley in the early 1920s. So Solzhenitsyn says, this didn't begin. This is not a Stalinist corruption. He quotes early on um, in uh, the, uh, there's a w wonderfully ironic chapter title, The History of Our Sewage Disposal System, the waves of people going in and in the camps. He quotes a text from Lenin, uh, January 1918, How to Organize the Competition. The title's um, ironic. And it's, uh, Lenin uses all sorts of language, the enemies of the people, the, the businessmen, the merchants, the aristocrats, supporters of the Tsar, Orthodox Christians, Tolstoyans. They're all vermin. They're cancerous drags. They're insects. And, so, and, and how to or organize the competition, Lenin says, our great task is to purge Russia of all the harmful insects. So Solzhenitsyn looks at all this, and he sees Stel uh, Stalinism as an amplification and radicalization of a disease that began with Marx and Lenin. But in 1945, when he's writing to, uh, I forget his name, Vitovich, his high school buddy, he still believed that Stalinism was a corruption of Marx and Lenin. Uh, later, Solzhenitsyn thought that was risible, that, this was, that he held this belief either out of misplaced ideological faith or because he did not really know the, the real nature of Leninism. But that was it. He was still, he didn't like Stalin, but he was still a Marxist-Leninist when he was arrested in East Prussia in February 1945. Does that help? Okay. Next. Uh, now, uh, I understand that uh, according to uh, Solzhenitsyn, the total number of victims of com communist system in Russia was um, at least 60 million. Uh, as we know, the uh, total number of Nazi concentration camps, labor camps, massive execution was about 6 million. So, if somebody asks who was the greatest criminal of the 20th century for me, the answer is Simple, not, certainly not Hitler, but Stalin. And uh, Russia was not the only country where 
a lot of people died because of communism. We know that millions die in China, Cambodia, Vietnam. Uh, so the total number of, of, uh, of the victims of the uh, communist system uh, was probably uh, well over 100 million. Even today, we have concentration camps in North Korea, as we know. So my question is, why in our Western world, uh, a lot of people know about Nazi crimes, not too many people know about communist crimes. Thank you. Some of you may know the British novelist Martin Amos. Uh, he writes for the New York Review of Books, kind of a typical lefty. He, uh, he wrote a book called Corva the Dread about 10 years ago, and he raised that question. He says, everyone knows Auschwitz, but no one knows Solovki. Everyone knows uh, uh, Himmler, no one knows Yezhov, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's true. Uh, my friend Ellen Besson, who was not soft on Nazism, uh, his inaugural address at the, uh, at the um, Institut de France, the Academy de Sciences Morales et Politique, was uh, the hyper amnesia of Nazism, a uh, hyper, uh, hyper memoir de Nazisme, the hyper amnesia of communism. And I think that's, uh, that was true in France and other countries for a long time. Um, about the numbers, um, I think Solzhenitsyn's numbers, I'm a great devotee of Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn didn't have access to archives. And by the way, the archives are not always reliable. They often underestimate. It's the self-reporting of the totalitarian regime, so they can't always be trusted. But um, uh, yeah, Solzhenitsyn uses the statistics put forward by a emigre who had studied these matters, who in the 60s had estimated 66 million political victims of the Soviet regime. I think the number is closer to 35 million. Now, that's still an extraordinary amount of people. Um, uh, some, millions died in the camps. Millions died leaving the camps from exhaustion and starvation. Uh, millions died on the way to the camp. Hundreds of thousands died on the way to the camps. A little shy of a million were shot in 36 and 37 at the beginning of the Great Terror. Millions more died in the wars against the peasantry. So I would say the single leading cause of death in the Soviet Union was the starving to death of those peasants who resisted collectivization. And contrary to legend, it wasn't just the Ukraine. It was Kuban and Russia. In the 20s, it was in the Volga region. A third of the people, nomadic people of Kazakhstan, starved to death in the early 30s, largely as a result of communist ideology and government policy. 85,000 priests and nuns were killed, according to Alexander Yakovlev, who was Gorbachev's right-hand man, maybe the only major Soviet communist uh, 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 official to take up Solzhenitsyn's suggestion of public repentance. Yakovlev had been a lifelong communist, he ended up being one of the architects of perestroika under Gorbachev. He was for 12 years Soviet ambassador to Canada. He rejected communism and he wrote a, he became the head of the Presidential Commission on Violence and Terror under Lenin and Stalin. And he wrote a book which has come out in English from Yale called uh, Century of Violence in Soviet Russia. He deals with the archives. He had unprecedented access to government, party, secret police and military archives. And he estimates about 35 million people perished as a result of the political policies of the Soviet Communist Party. So your broad point, I think, is right. I wouldn't underestimate Hitler's, though. Yes, 5.9 to 6.1 million Jews were killed, but about 25 million people were killed during the war as a result of Nazi policy. But your larger point about global uh, communism is true. Um, the best scholars estimate 45 to 72 million people in Maoist China. Uh, much of that during the Great Leap Forward, but also in the anti-landlord campaigns and anti-religious uh, persecutions of the 50s, the Cultural Revolution, 66 to 77. Um, um, Ho Chi Minh killed a lot of people in uh, North Vietnam. He wasn't this heroic nationalist. I always love 
you know, Ken Burns telling me, I was just a Vietnamese nationalist. Ho Chi Minh was one of the six founders of the French Communist Party in 1919. He was a Stalinist ideologue. <laughs> and he did all the same things Mao and Stalin did. Religious persecution, he killed all the Vietnamese Trotskyites, <laughs> you had a Vietnamese gulag, so no, he was not a good guy. Uh, Pol Pot actually studied Marxism. He got a, Kim saint Pierre, his number two, got a PhD under Marxist professors in Paris in 1959, and he wrote a dissertation on the social purification of the Cambodian countryside, which was literally carried out by the Khmer Rouge government. So blow me your mind. And the book on this, it's a scientific book. I've carefully argued, I think the numbers are rather low because they only want to establish what they can prove. But it's the Black Book of Communism, edited by Stefan Courtois and Nicolas Vert. Came out in Paris in 98, and uh, it's still available in hardback from Harvard University Press. And it's the most comprehensive academic and scientific study of the human cost of communist totalitarianism in the 20th century. So just, just following up from some of the things you said. Yes. Well, look, I think it's very important to use the word ideology in a specific way. Um, many people, and this has to do with the corruptions and philosophy and the social sciences, use it as a synonym for perspectivism. In other words, there's a conservative ideology, there's a liberal ideology, there's a socialist ideology. We all have a point of view, it's relative, um, and um, you, we really can't attain truth. Now, Aristotle tells us in the politics, there are partisans. Democrats, oligarchs, they have part of the truth. But the whole point of political philosophy is we have debate and disputation, and the political philosopher acts as an umpire, trying to show what's partially true in these different accounts. I think that's a much better approach than reducing all human truth claims and partisan political positions to ideologies. So the Eastern dissidents always use um, the word ideology for these um, movements of thought and political regimes that reduce politics to ideological mannequinism. Evil over there, all good over here, and are committed to utopian social engineering through the use of violence and, and coercion. Um, yes, you know, um, you have a point in this way. Burke said in the midst of the French Revolution, Edmund Burke, who created fit into their vision or picture 
of, um, of uh, contemporary Russia. Yes. Yeah. No, 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 I wasn't. I was, give, I was giving that as an example. under assault for a half century. So I, I don't see, I, I can't go with you about the New York Times and Washington Post. They identify the sheer idea of truth as an invitation for political and intellectual fanaticism. That does not describe Solzhenitsyn's position at all. Uh, one more question, I think, with Dr. Hagstrom. Thanks very much for your paper. Thanks for coming to Providence. As someone who sits on the committee here at PC to help us decide who gets honorary degrees and who might be our graduation speaker, I have a question about his address at Harvard. How did that happen? Uh, how did it happen? In 16. Oh, sure. Solzhenitsyn said in his memoir that he had some things to say, and Harvard, he said Harvard was uh, an opportunity to have an audience, a global audience, not just the 20,000 people in attendance, but in effect the whole world would hear what he said. Now, if you read Between Two Millstones, um, the excerpt on the Harvard Address appeared on the June 7th, uh, 2018 issue of National Review. Solzhenitsyn says, I was appalled but with, about what people said I said in the Harvard Address. So he begins, he says, I speak as a friend. He says he believes in the rule of law, but not in its reduction to legalism. He says that um, I don't want to go back to spiritual despotism or theocracy, but he says we want to build on the historic achievements in the modern world. There's no place to go but up balance of the needs of the soul and the body. All that got left out. And the, the typical response was that he was calling for World War III and attacking America and showed no appreciation. And the first word, he says, I speak as a friend. And he even said, I, uh, um, he spoke of his admiration for the American founding and the Declaration of Independence. And he said, the early Americans knew that liberty needed to be supported by a rich tradition of mercy and sacrifice that came from an older Western tradition. So Solzhenitsyn was rather appalled that all these things were said about his address. But then he said 
he started getting letters from all over America from ordinary folk who said, you've spoken for me. You've articulated some of my decent, deepest concerns. And then he says, then I, re I started to realize America's pretty split. And the New York Times and the Washington Post don't speak for all the American people. So it's a very interesting response. But yes, he turned it down first. He accepted it the second time. And he did not regret accepting it. Uh, so that's the, do you, do you want any more background or is that good enough? Okay. I'd like to take, <clears throat> I'd like to say two, uh, make two announcements before um, thanking Professor Mahoney. Um, there's, there's a uh, small, or a, there, there's a uh, reception, there'll be a reception, not a small one, everyone's invited to come and have something to drink. And it's not big, but it's not small either. Uh, <laughs> it's a moderate sized reception. In when the, I was a freshman at Holy Cross in 1978, all, the drinking age was 18, and all the receptions had wine and cheese. So people would come to talks they weren't interested in because <laughs> they could get wine at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. But I'm just reminding you of a lost world that... Uh... It'd be nice to return to that world, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, uh, please join us in the great room for a reception uh, immediately after the talk. And I also want to remind you, next week's uh, Humanities Forum lecture will be by a friend of Professor Mahoney's, uh, that was kind of accidental. We, I don't think you even knew that that was going to happen. But Professor Gary Saul Morrison from Northwestern University, who's a professor of Slavic languages there, will be speaking about uh, speaking to us about literature and torture. I believe is the name of his talk. But it's it's again based on uh, the readings for the semester uh, from Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn. So we we invite you to come He's next the week. The best Slavist in the United States. He's a beautiful writer, and in his course at Northwestern. He's famous for being able to imitate the different characters in Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. <laughs> but he's, uh, he, he is a, just a wonderfully articulate, learned uh, advocate for all the human wisdom that can be to, to uh, derived from the Russian literary tradition and spiritual tradition. Wonderful. We look forward to that. Thank you, Professor Mahoney, for coming this afternoon. Thank you for coming.